I've missed you, and I hope you're enjoying these episodes. You know, because I'm about to say, they're about to end. Now, but what I mean by that is that, so the retro ups and downs, which we are having so much fun with, we do between seasons of Star Trek. And of course, the next thing you know is, we have a double premiere of Star Trek Discovery coming next week. So what that means is that the retro ups and downs are gonna go on pause for a little while, and we're gonna go back into our weekly ups and downs of Star Trek Discovery. Uh, now, unusually, because it's a double premiere next week, you're gonna get two episodes of ups and downs next week. Now, they are going to be done separately. That's how we're gonna do it. So episode one, and then we're going to do the ups and downs for that. Episode two, and then we're going to do the ups and downs for that. So you will still get one ups and downs per episode of Star Trek. Cool. The best way to stay on top of everything is just make sure you're subscribed. Uh, really, really appreciate it when you do. Thank you so much, everyone who already has. Thank you so much, everyone who's gonna do it on this video. Seriously, thank you so much. We're actually really super duper close to 300,000 subscribers, and we have a little special thing ready and waiting to go once we cross that milestone. So look, thank you so much, everyone who's helping us get there. You guys are awesome. Shall we discuss an episode of Star Trek? <gasps> Perish the thought. I have no problem saying from the outset that this is an episode I've wanted to cover for such a long time. Bananas. So much is happening right from the off and right the way through. It's, it's one of the busiest episodes I think I remember watching in such a long time. But... We're gonna go through it as we always do, start to finish. So the first up that I'm giving this week is just that entire opening sequence in Quarks. Because for an episode that has such a reputation about the beginning of the Dominion War that this episode has, the fact that we open with a discussion of Rom and Lita's wedding, they're going through wedding dress uh, choices. You've got Garrick is there, Zial is there, Quark pops his head in. It's a lovely little slice of life on Deep Space Nine. You get a few of these dotted throughout the episode, and I'm probably going to call them each out as they go. It goes straight then into a, a you know, again, a happy little moment, which is Rom and Lita approach Captain Sisko, and Rom just goes, Will you marry me? And it's just, it's so sweet. It's definitely an up from me. It's so lovely and sweet. Dark as this episode gets, the, these are the moments that I think help it to, to rise a little bit. The context of where they've just stopped Cisco is that he's just spoken to Miles. Uh, Miles actually starts that sequence by going, Keiko and the kids will be safer on Earth. There is a sort of a, a sort of a running thing throughout Deep Space Nine of how will we explain Keiko being away this week? And I actually think this one was quite good. It's simple, it's to the point. She's not gone off for six months to Bajor to, you know, bot botanical studies, and that's fine. In that first sentence, we get the rising sense of threat. And of course, Cisco and O'Brien take their place by the viewing port. I do have, I've won down, right? Because I have to, I snorted when I watched it. They walk in and Cisco just steps right in front of two other people. Avery Brooks is not a small man. So I just love the fact that he just went, <laughs> out of the way, fives, a 10 is here. Uh, sorry, but I mean, I love it, but like, down, dude, they were watching. Now, I don't think they'll like the view very much regardless, because of course, then we get our fabulous shot of the wormhole opens and we have another massive Dominion convoy comes through the wormhole. Because of course, Cardassia joined the Dominion. Thanks a bunch, Ducat. We get then a scene which, again, I'm gonna try not to say slice of life as many times as I want to in this episode, because I feel like there's gonna be a lot, but we cut to Ben and Jake. They're having food together, uh, because I honestly can't remember if it's breakfast or dinner. I'm so sorry, I should have written that down. But they're discussing what turns out to be Jake's first published article for the Federation News Network. And this scene is an up from me because it feels very real. You know, just so often that, you know, when either actor was interviewed or is interviewed about Deep Space Nine, they say, what's your favorite part? They each say the relationship between Ben and Jake. And this is a very short scene, but it really works just to show that comfort between the two men. Also to set up the fact that, hey, Jake's got a job. As a writer, I know how good it can feel to have some sort of, you know, well, not so much income in DS9, but you know what I mean? Like steady work. There's a fun little scene uh, in the cargo bay 
that establishes the storyline gets touched on with Kira and Odo in this episode. Uh, they've discovered that someone, so Quark, has tried to smuggle in so much Yamak sauce because he's convinced that the Dominion are going to invade and take back the station. All right, listen, Quark, I need to know who your informant is because you apparently seem to know something. The scene also reminds us that, yes, there is a slight air of discomfort between Kira and Odo uh, because of, well, listen, we'll come to that in the temporal observations, won't we? Nog hands a mug of coffee to Captain Sisko and then quickly asks, is it true, sir, what they're saying about the Romulans? And Sisko says, well, don't forget the 190th rule of acquisition. Here all, trust nothing. We then get this brilliant little editing moment. Nog has put the idea in Sisko's head that the Romulans have signed a non-aggression pact with the Dominion. Sisko goes, oh, this might be worth checking, so put me through to Starfleet Command. And as he throws up the baseball and goes to catch it, we immediately hard cut to Worf, slamming his fist down on the table in the wardroom, going Romulans, up. That was a brilliant piece of editing there. It really hammers it home. And this discussion then, Romulans have no honor. Technically, the Romulans haven't sided with the Dominion. They just have a non-aggression pact, so they won't be drawn into the fighting. Odo kind of lists off how serious it's getting. Romulans are only one of several races that have done this as well. And this is where we get our infamous moment of Cisco going, we're going to mine the entrance to the wormhole. And then we get the discussion of well, if we mine the entrance to the wormhole, we may end up starting a war. And there's a chilling statement. Regardless, we're losing the peace, so a war may be our only hope. Avery Brooks taken up for the delivery of that line because you can see how sickened he is having to say it as well. I mean, war as your only hope, horrific as an idea. The character of Rom is so interesting in Star Trek because so often he is the comic relief. When you think Rom is Oppenheimer, hold on a second there. This scene, which sees the idea of self-replicating minds come out of Rom's brain, was directly parallel with, the, it, was, it was deliberate. They wanted people to think of the Manhattan Project. We're trying to come up with a way of destroying things with as much efficiency and range as possible. We are talking about it like we are just trying to fix another self-sealing stem bolt. And then out of the blue, we've got the idea of cloaked mines that will swarm, detonate and self-replicate. It's a terrifying weapon. When you think about it, really, what a deadly weapon to have, to have come up with. And yet it's in the context of Rom is panicky because he hasn't requisitioned new quarters. Where's Lita gonna put her clothes? You know, have these two ways of playing it, both dead straight and also camp side by side of that is an absolute up from me. I, I, I feel like there was this deliberate inclusion of that comedy so that perhaps we wouldn't spend too much time focusing on the fact that they are effectively coming up with the A-bomb because they are the good guys, right? We get the impression that there's bigger plans happening when Kira and Worf both ask Cisco, so, you know, when are the reinforcements getting here and how many ships can we expect? And Cisco goes, we're not and none. And then you get Worf straight away goes, as strategic operations officer, and I had a moment of, oh yeah, <laughs> as strategic operations officer, I cannot guarantee the safety of the station. Your concerns are noted. But Kira then asks, well, what's Starfleet doing that they can't send us ships? And Worf goes, that is not our concern. Our concern now is preparing the station for battle. Taken up. One of the many things I love about the character of Worf is that once he kind of got away from the next generation and the constant, shut up Worf, no Worf, that's wrong Worf, he flourished on Deep Space Nine. And even just his efficiency, just his professionalism in this scene really adds to this air of, no, man knows what he's doing. And... And it really comes across well. Speaking of another man who knows what he's doing, we get our next scene of Kira and Odo. Odo suggests to Kira that, look, we're gonna shut down all outgoing communications, but I've already prepared a whole bunch of fake messages so that it will look like, from the outside, no one has, there is no difference on DS9. It's tactically brilliant. 
and and then we thankfully we get a scene where they relax around each other and you know with a little bit of gallows humor they go we've got bigger things to worry about than our feelings so let's just let's just be the people we've always been and i do love how nana visitor and renee aubergeonois play these scenes i will discuss a bit of their relationship when we come to temporal observations as well but for now up and easy and whopper up for me jeffrey combs the scene in the wardroom where Wayun turns to Cisco and says, I'll keep this brief. We know all about the minefield. Either you remove the mines or we will take the station from you and remove them ourselves. Just the way he delivers it. I love it. And then Cisco's, let me be blunt. The mines stay. I will not allow any more reinforcements through the wormhole. You will not allow. Oh. And because you can see the moment as well where they both go, it's war. Wayun is better at it because he's the more practiced politician. Captain Sisko, you're straight away into that kind of the smarmy, the grin, the oh, we're all friends here. Meanwhile, he's counting torpedoes in his head, but it's a great scene. And we get another, uh, it's less of a hard cut edit, but we get another quick edit where it goes from, today we have taken the first steps to a lasting peace between our peoples, they're going to attack. Oh, I love this, it's so busy, this episode. Things really begin to kick off at this point because once Wayun goes, it's only as long as it takes to get back to Cardassia and then back again before things are going to go to pot. We get Martok, who's going to take the Rotaran and patrol the Cardassian border. Dax and O'Brien are aboard the Defiant trying to load all these mines. You have Bashir, Sasks again. You don't think Starfleet could spare any ships, say 50. And Sisko says, I'm afraid not. And he goes, well, I'm going to go and get the infirmary ready. Everyone hops to it. Um, we do then get, it's, this is one, it's a scene that's a bit of a payoff from an earlier episode, but Cisco and Kira discussing Bajor and the non-aggression pact with the Dominion. Cisco basically flexes a muscle he doesn't often flex and says, as, you know, as the emissary of the prophets, I'm going to endorse it. Kira's a bit like, why? We can't guarantee Bajor's safety if fighting breaks out. You have to be kept out of the fighting. And so they go ahead and they do it. They sign this. Well, it's a pact. It's not a treaty treaty, but that's it. They're now friends. And yeah, we, we you know, we start to see the Bajorans start to leave. Don't say slice of life. Don't say slice of life. Rom and Lita's wedding, which Cisco, in the middle of everything else, still performs the ceremony. And it's beautiful and it's quick. And we get that wonderful homage to Casablanca at the end of it as well. You I mean, you could nearly hear Rick saying, you don't get on that plane, you'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday and for the rest of your life. And it's brilliant. It just works. It's that, that is an up for me. The wedding itself is an up. Rom's take on that speech is an up. Max Grudenschik is brilliant in that scene. That's nearly the end of our, our kind of like daily life because there's not much time for daily life. Zial has left to go to Bajor as well. Tor Zial never got enough to do. Uh, she gets more to do in season six for a while. Um, but yeah, she, she never really got enough to do, but I do like her pairing with Garrick, particularly obviously, particularly in this episode um, because it gives some, some nice other things for Garrick to do. Um, but speaking of Garrick and his boyfriend, Bashir is there getting the infirmary ready and Jake is there with Bashir. And this is crucial. And again, temporal observations, but it's crucial that it's Bashir and Jake who are preparing for battle here. Because of course, they have a history of battle together. And Bashir, he, he straight out asks him, are you okay? And Jake's like, mm, I, I, I'll do what I can. You know, here is this character who is not a soldier by any means. He is there because Ben Sisko took the post five years previously. That, that's why he's on board the station. And when you see how much he's grown in those five years, uh, not to mention grown, I mean, the man's like 11 foot tall. He's very much a man here. And you do see it in these episodes, as opposed to the boy that he was when the show began. There's, of course, that, that funny moment, of, you know, when you're reporting, remember, Bashir is spelled with an I. But that's an up for me. In fact, overall, this, this segment of battle preparations is an up, which leads into another quick scene. This is a scene that I'm so glad they included this because it's so short and it's Garrick and Odo. Garrick says, you know, you are an island of calm in a sea of chaos. And 
I can't do anything. All of my Bajoran staff have been sent back to Bajor. Quintessential Garrick. You know, when the Klingons attacked, I found myself fighting side by side with Dukat. And for a moment, he turned his back to me and he presented a very tempting target. Oh, goes, you'd shoot a man in the back. Well, it's the safest way. Up. Dark, but up. Speaking of Dukat, he decides to make a phone call and... Dukat and Damar and Weyoun are then shown via the view screen aboard a Dominion ship. Dukat very sardonically goes, Captain Sisko, I don't suppose you'd consider surrendering and sparing unnecessary bloodshed? Absolutely not. I was hoping you'd say that. You know, it's very classic Dukat. I, I do have a down, and the down is those shoulder-mounted view screen in your brain, because it's like the only time we see them. Because immediately when we see them next, it becomes the headband. And that's what we see for the rest of, of the show. But also, it's not just the design of them. It's, where's the view screen? Like, where's Ducat looking? They've never made sense to me. Uh, I'll be, at least, at least when you see the updated one, they're like, yep, yeah, cool, all right, that's fine. I'm, yeah, I'm moving the view. But then how do they see you? That, that's a down. We have that sort of, you know, mustache twirling. You know, first we take back Tarek North, then on to Bajor. And Weyoun goes, I... We'll remind you that Dominion have signed a non-aggression pact with Bajor. Dukat goes, they may have. I never did. Oh, it's just classic Dukat arrogance, isn't it? You know, he thinks I can do whatever I want. And thankfully, you've got Wayun there to go, you're part of the Dominion. You will fall in line. I mean, these are the bad guys. So I shouldn't be like, mm, I'm happy about that. But yeah, fair play, Wayun. I agree. The second battle of Deep Space Nine is, it's an up. First of all, I mean, of course it is. You have these Dominion ships, Jem'Hadar, Cardassian attacking the station and the station's holding its own. In fact, they marvel about how are they, how are their shields staying up? They do send ships after the Defiant and then we get, or I, I, I have it down here, but let me explain it. We get this moment of cheese. Keeping the Defiant out of the fight, the Defiant has to set the mines. They can't come in firing because it risks setting off the mines. Great, right, so they're effectively off the board. So they're a sitting duck with the Dominion firing at them. And then we get that scene of the Bird of Prey decloaking and, you know, Martok to save the day. Love all of that. And then it's just that phone call between Martok and Dax. Who says there's never a Klingon around when you need one? I love how she, I, it was cheesy, it was hammy. I'm giving it a down. I'm sorry, because it was so cheesy and hammy, but what a, I think they had fun that day. It seems, in a way, it seems odd because with the weapon systems deployed and, you know, DS9 firing away, and as we find out later on, they take down 50 Dominion ships. I mean, that's not inconsiderable. But you're there thinking, going, well, hang on, she fired an awful lot more when it was the Klingons. One wonders when we, we subsequently learn what we do, was the plan always that there's no way we can hold the station? It's, it's not a thing. You know, we know that Cisco has been preparing his failsafe program, Cisco 197, but was it always the plan to abandon the station? And, you know, you have to wonder either way, because if so, would you not tell the Bajorans that? Or, 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 or what? I mean, straight away, it's Worf, fire at will. And he certainly fires weapons, but nothing like the Klingons. So it makes me think that there was more of a, we are, we are purely here to delay the Dominion, that they never had a hope of winning. And that's a somber feeling in this episode. Behind the scenes, they talked about how this episode was about goodbyes as much as everything else. And we get a lot of goodbyes. We get Cisco's goodbye standing on the promenade. We get Dax and Worf's goodbye there at the airlock. We get Garrick and Zial's goodbye. We get Roman Lita's goodbye. You do feel that. You really do feel that in this episode. And again, with everything that's going on all around them, that these moments shine through. They're, they're, they're an up. To concentrate on Cisco's just for a second, and then that revelation that this Starfleet Klingon task force crossed into Dominion territory and destroyed the shipyards on Taurus III. Make no mistake, they were forced into it but Starfleet and the Klingons started the Dominion War. And it's something that's often overlooked. Um, and it's, I suppose, when you think of a case of blame, whatever, but they started it. Big, big, and again, we go back to that statement from earlier on, because they were losing the peace, this was the only hope. It's, I was too young to appreciate this the first time I watched this episode, when it aired back in the 90s. I did not understand the political overtones that were going on in this episode. Now I'm just like, 
Why was Star Trek? Okie dokie. Once the Defiant and the Rotaran get away from the station, Kira initiates Cisco 197, which effectively destroys the computer core. Um, and it's a stark scene, we get that. It's, the, it's not hammed up at all. The Dukat wants the station back, he can have it. Mm, Nana Visitor nails the delivery of that as well. And then sends the message to the Dominion. He's like, you can stop shooting at us. You know, they're not here anymore. So that's important that they do include that scene as well. We cut very quickly to Quark, who is, you know, get rid of all the root beer. We don't want any root beer in this bar, not at all. Uh, you know, break out the canard. And Rom steps in and announces himself as, you know, the assistant manager. And Quark's like, what are you doing here? And Rom goes, actually, I'm a spy for Starfleet. Tell nobody. Down, every Ferengi in that room heard that. But Quark plays along and Rom starts to walk away. And that's when we discover Jake has stayed behind. To discuss it fully, it's gonna to have to, I mean, in the context, so put a pin in, I'm giving this a whopper of an up, and I'll discuss it properly now when we get to temporal observations. Can't turn back for one man. Dukas, Wayun, Odo, Kira, Quark, Damar, Damar's smug little smile, all of it. And then of course, I mean, I think we probably knew this was coming. Dukat enters the, the office, sees the baseball, goes, it's a message, it says, He'll be back. And we cut to that shot of the Defiant and the Rotaran joining the then largest collection of Starfleet and Klingon ships that had ever been seen in the franchise. Up, laden them up. Temporal observations. Rizy and traditional wedding dresses, you have Tellarite modern. There is one thing which I think is a, I'm probably really looking way too far into this, is that they've looked at 153 different dresses. That means then to get to the nearest big number, which would be 200, there's 47. In the Jake and Ben scene, Ben asks, well, what about your novel at one point? If any of the future shown in The Visitor is to be believed, which of course, m much of it can't, Come true but if it does we do know that Jake will eventually go on and finish his novel Anselm so I, I choose to believe that he will. There's a deep and very quick little callback when they're discussing the Romulan non-aggression pact and Odo says that the Dominion is making impressive inroads into the Alpha Quadrant he name drops the Tholians but he also name drops the Miradorn. Now we met the Miradorn back in the first season in the episode of Vortex this was an early Odo episode that showed two Miradorn twins who were chasing after a criminal. Now this criminal had connections, coming from the Gamma Quadrant as he did, had connections to what would eventually turn out to be the founders. He introduced the word changeling, for example, to Odo's vocabulary. The fact that the Miradorn, who were chasing the one with the connection to the founders, have signed this treaty with the Dominion that is a very deep little cut, which I really, really liked. Now, I mentioned earlier this idea of the Manhattan Project, and that was deliberate. As they were writing the episode, the writers really wanted that to come across as this is the idea of coming up with the A-bomb. There's so much allegory around World War II in this episode. If you think of the idea of the Federation and, for a time, the Bajorans all trying to get away from the station, that's Dunkirk. You know, that's this idea of everyone trying to just get the heck out of there. Well, now, fortunately, we don't have all of the locals turning up in their boats to help them escape. I, I suppose you could say that, you know, Martok and the Rotaran are doing a lot of heavy lifting in that respect. But it's this idea of what is hopeless when it's in the context of something much larger. This idea that, you know, we have created this weapon that will in fact, or at least stop the buildup of military on Cardassia, at least for a time. We also have managed to destroy some of what they already had. There's, well, frankly, dark historical parallels to what's going on in this episode. And as I say, it was very much deliberate. Now, I want you to come back to Jake and Bashir. Earlier on, quite early on in the season, there's the episode, Nor the Battle to the Strong. And it is a fabulous episode and one of the better ones featuring Sorok Lofton. In that episode, Bashir and Jake 
are effectively pulled into a skirmish on Agilon Prime. In that, Jake is tested, he finds cowardice within himself, and also he finds bravery, because, of course, one can only be brave when they're, when they're scared. Thanks, Mufasa, for teaching me that one. That is very deliberately referenced again here in this episode. Obviously, in the scene in the infirmary, when Bashir asks Jake, are you okay? Now, that is a heavy question, because that is not just, are you okay in this current moment? It's, I know you're reliving what we went through on that planet. Are you okay? Later on, then, when Jake elects to stay behind, I interpret this, it's not just about reporting the news. This, to me, is Jake still trying to make up for his actions on that planet. There's a moment where he runs away from battle. So many people must have either done so or considered doing so when in the heat of battle. And that guilt has stayed with him for the full season. So his choice to stay behind is perhaps a little foolish, but I think it's coming from a place of atonement. As we would look forward then into season six, we see more of Jake the reporter. The first six episodes, I suppose one can't not discuss the first six episodes of season six when discussing Call to Arms because there was a plan. The opening for season six had already been written by the time that this episode was going through post-production. You know, specifically in that last shot, which I, it's, it, look, it's my Latin up. I love that last shot. I think it's amazing. There's so much going on in that shot. But Iris Stephen Bear wasn't a fan because written in the script was the Defiant and the Rotaran join a group of other ships. That's what was written. So this was sent off to, you know, the department that looks after this and they said brilliant da, 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 and they have that fantastic shot of them joining and turning around to fly back the way they came, which suggests, all right, we lost that battle, but Dominion, you're about to lose the next one. And it's a real pump in the air moment and it's like, yeah, here we go. Ah! But it wasn't at all what they wanted. They didn't want to do that. So the opening scene for A Time to Stand was updated to show what was left of that fleet, that they got absolutely nobbled by the Dominion. I mean, talk about starting dark. And I think that happy little accident makes both episodes stronger. Uh, big time, big time there. Because we had this excitement. We were waiting to see, right, what Starfleet... Because, you know, historically, we would be expecting part two of this episode, not part one of six going into season six. You know, this, this, this was the test arc. Yes, we had done, for example, we'd done the Circle trilogy back in season two. So that was a three part episode. That itself was a gamble. And of course, long running storylines, like, you know, you had, well, I suppose, Defiant going into Improbable Cause and the Die is Cast with the, you know, this whole mystery of the Obsidian Order. But here you had something that had never been tried in Star Trek before a six, part, I say it's a seven part story because I include Call to Arms in it, but let's say a six part Dominion War arc that is about let's retake the station. And I think in no small part, we can thank that for, obviously for the 10 episode arc in season seven, for the Zindi arc in Enterprise season three. And although in general, TV has gone this way, you know, if we just keep it Star Trek specific, think about shows like Discovery, Picard, or, or, or Prodigy even. Yeah, maybe less so Prodigy, but yeah, no, maybe still Prodigy. Anyway, what I'm saying is that serialized storytelling truly began here in Star Trek. That last fleet shot is very important because it's one of the last shots that included physical filming models. In fact, the last shot is the opening shot of the next episode of Time to Stand. But here you had a filming model of the Katinga class, the Vorcha, the Miranda class. We had CGI models in there as well. We'd just done all the handovers from First Contact, for example. You had the Sabre class, you had the Akira class, you had the Steamrunner. They're all included in these. You had several Defiant class ships, which is fun. Also in this episode, let's not forget as well, the whole scene about the treaty between Bajor and the Dominion. A few episodes previously in Rapture, Cisco stopped Bajor joining the Federation. And you're like, well, hold up now. That was literally your job to come here and do this. If they had signed and joined the Federation that day, they wouldn't have been able to sign the treaty in this one. They would have been pulled into the fighting and Bajor could have been one of the first worlds destroyed in the Dominion War. Bit of a dark payoff, but a payoff nonetheless. Speaking of payoff, Romulans 
Obviously, Romulus really signs this non-aggression uh, pact with the Dominion. Don't worry, though. Cisco takes care of that. There's so much that this is owed to this episode about what Star Trek has done since. And there's so much it does right. I want to as well give a special shout out to, you know, the music in this episode. It's just fabulous. Particularly, obviously, that closing cue, but battle preparations, all of it. We have introduction of arcs. We have settling of some arcs. Uh, although it's by no means the introduction of Damar, Damar gets a lot more to do in this episode, obviously. That will go on. He won't just be Dukat's aide going forward. There's the reminder that Cardassia is part of the Dominion now, and the Dominion will make the decisions. Not you, Dukat. We'll see how that goes, won't we? Also, as well, uh, a, a scene that, you know, perhaps is understandably overlooked is that as Dax is walking back onto the station after setting the minefield, the keep an eye on the screen directly behind her right shoulder, and you'll see an injured crewman leaving. That was Robert Hewitt Wolfe, who wrote for Star Trek for rather a lot of time. He invented such characters as, oh, I don't know, Garrick and Kai Wynn. This would be, he was leaving the show in a full-time capacity. He did write an episode of season seven as a freelancer. Um, but yeah, it's nice that he got his cameo there. This set the stage for one of the biggest waits in Star Trek history. And if, if you tell me that the best of both worlds, Locutus, is your number one cliffhanger ending, I will be like, fair enough, 100%, no problem. But if you're like me, you'll see those ships fly, join the task force, and come back to remind the Dominion exactly why the Alpha Quadrant is for Starfleet and its allies, and you'll think that this might be the best season finale of them all. That's everything today. Thank you so much for watching along. Now remember, next week, Star Trek Discovery Season 5. So yeah, really looking forward to seeing what you think of that. Thank you to everyone who's been enjoying these retro ups and downs. They are by no means finished. We're, they're just going to be up all as well. We concentrate on the new episodes for now. So do get in touch. Let us know what episodes would you like to see going forward. We'd really, really, really love to hear your feedback on these. Everyone, please follow us on all the various socials. We're at Trek Culture, at Trek Culture YT. I'm at Sean Ferrick. And of course, don't forget to follow the lovely Chris at Edit Chris Edit as well. Please subscribe. We're nearly there. You're awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you next week for the first episode of Season 5 of Discovery Red Directive. Until then, live long and prosper, and I'll see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>